Uh, if you're in the lobby, come on in, make yourselves at home. Let's all stand together, look up to the screens. We'll begin this morning worship. Blessed be the name. Let's sing out this morning.
rise, He will call me home. The Lord is my Did anyone not receive a handout when you came in this morning? If you didn't, you can wave your hand there. Steve makes his way around. Make sure everyone got a copy of that. That's a handout for this morning's message. We're working through a sermon series right now on the book of Esther. And uh, this week and then next week will be our final week in Esther. And then we'll move on to a new study following that. I want to say a very special good morning to all of you, especially those of you who maybe are joining us for the first time today. And uh, just to give you an idea of what's to come, we're going to sing one more song together, then we're going to open up God's Word and study it. Uh, primarily at our church, we do that verse by verse through books or passages of the Bible, and right now we are going through Esther. And so if you don't have a Bible with you, you feel free to use that handout that you got when you came in, or there should be a, a Bible in a seat pocket somewhere near you or a seat rack somewhere near you. And if you don't have a Bible at home, feel free to take that with you as our gift to you. Uh, we'd love for you to have a copy of Scripture there in your house as long as you say you'll read it, right? We'd love for you to be able to take that with you and have that in your home. And we also have a gift for you if this is your first time on your way out today. And at the end of our service, we normally pass offering plates. We're not doing that right now due to the coronavirus situation. Uh, they're available in the back for our church family. But if you're new uh, to our church, please don't feel any obligation towards that. That's something that we do as a church family. Uh, we really just are glad you're here. We hope the service is an encouragement to you. There should be a yellow card in a seat pocket somewhere near you. If you would take a minute and fill that out and drop an offering plate on your way out. We just want to send a gift to you to say thank you for being here with us this morning. We also have a gift on your way out. We hope you like coffee because both gifts revolve around coffee, all right? So you'll have a, a frappuccino for you on your way out and uh, a little book so you can read on, the, on, on your week this week and then a surprise in your mailbox at some point in the next few days. And I uh, just want to say thank you. We know there's a lot of options of places to worship. And we're honored you chose to be with us this morning. Uh, our kids' ministry takes place at 11 o'clock. So if you have little ones with you, they're welcome to join in. I hope they sing out. They sing out well during the singing time. We do have the, um, you know, the kids in with us during the message time as well. I want to encourage you to be patient with those little ones that are around you. And remember, if you used to have little ones, what it was like when you had little ones, trying to keep them still. So uh, we're glad to have children in our church, and they're a blessing to us. And 11 o'clock, we do have our kids' services and nurseries available as well. If that works out better for you next time, you'll know that. But um, also, behind the doors, the double doors right here, don't go through there right now, just because it is uh, definitely in demolition zone. We try to encourage you guys to kind of walk around and see what's going on in the different projects. Right now, there's giant holes in the ground over there, so don't walk but over there. You can look through the windows and see. Uh, but that will eventually all be New Hope Kids. It'll be two uh, awesome nurseries, kids' classrooms, a big play area, kind of play space in the fellowship hall, and uh, we're working every week towards that. And uh, I mentioned we're shooting for Easter to have that open, and then we have giant holes in the ground, so maybe next Easter. Now, we'll figure out when it'll be done, but uh, I don't know how many of you guys have ever done a construction project or done much of them, 
what I'm learning is it costs twice as much as you thought it was going to cost, and it takes twice as long as you thought it was going to take, is what we're discovering. But little by little, uh, we're excited to turn this banquet facility into, into a God's home and a God's house, and it doesn't matter if there's ugly carpet or pretty carpet, it doesn't matter if there's holes in the ground or not, we're here to worship the Lord this morning, we're glad you decided to be here with us. Let's stand together once again, look up the screens, we'll sing one more song together. Uh, what a beautiful name, the name of Jesus. Is a 
Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And as you are, if you have a copy of Scripture, we're going to be in the book of Esther. Esther chapter number five this morning. And we're going to cover a lot of ground, so if you have a copy of Scripture with you, I'd encourage you to open it up and follow along with me if you could. And if not, feel free to use that Bible in a seat pocket near you or the handout you got when you got in this morning. This is right about the time that my wife and I usually like to uh, go on vacation. We like to try and get out of like the last couple weeks of February, early, or last couple weeks of January, early February, because I am not from here, okay? So my, my skin hasn't quite thickened or blood thickened, as you guys call it, so I'm I'm cold, um, but I still love living here. People always ask me this time of year, are you guys moving away? No, but maybe for a couple weeks, and we'll be back. But um, this year, of course, we are here with the rest of you for the time being. But we can long, longfully look for the sun in a beach somewhere. And that's what I'm doing this morning. I'm imagining myself. Um, you don't have to imagine that. It's not a pretty picture. But uh, Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5. Uh, th- this past year, uh, actually 2019, marked 500 years when a German monk named Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle. If you don't know much about that, I encourage you to read it and, and look up uh, the story of Martin Luther, one of the heroes, really, of, of evangelicalism, of Christianity. That was arguably his most memorable act, that big historic moment, but his most memorable words came a few years later when he was on trial for instigating a civil rebellion against the Holy Catholic Church. And he's He's standing there in the courtroom, Martin Luther, and the entire German royalty and Holy Roman Empire elites are all there. They've laid out copies in front of him of all of his writings. He knows what they want. They want him to recant of all that he's talked about, all that he's taught about salvation by grace through faith and and not of works. For four years, this, this revolution has kind of been spinning out of control, and they want the guy that started it to end all of it, right? The same guy whose words began all of this, it's his moment to end it. And if they can break Luther through political pressure, if they can break Luther in this moment, the whole thing loses its steam. Because it's one thing to to nail a paper to a door in the middle of the night. It's another thing to stand in front of a hostile court. And with everybody watching him and everybody looking on, knowing that if he doesn't recant, then he's doomed to prison, at the best and worst uh, to death, Luther says to these these people, he says, unless you can show me from Scripture where I'm wrong, in any of these writings, I will not recant. And the famous phrase he offers, he says, here I stand, I can do no other. That was kind of Martin's moment. Either given to the threats that were coming upon him, either given to the pressure of of the political elites in order to spare his own life, or trust God, or, or stand on the authority of scriptures, or to stand on truth and not the, the corrupt empire of the church. He saw his moment, and his conviction before God was worth more to him than his life. So he stood firm, and he was condemned as a criminal by those in power. And then as a result of that, the Protestant Reformation began to snowball. And 500 years later, we are sitting here, profoundly shaped by that moment of courage, shaped by a feisty German monk's moment. But here's the thing, Martin's moment, what we're seeing this morning, wasn't really his moment. Luther's influence was also a huge product of the day he was living in. He didn't control the invention of the printing press 80 years earlier by a fellow German. At one point in his life, Martin's writings accounted for 25% of all printed material in the known world was writings by Martin Luther. Martin didn't create the thunderstorm that almost killed him when he swore to God he'd live if he uh, was able to live through the thunderstorm. Basically, if you zoom out from Martin Luther's moment, you see Martin was not the root of the Protestant Reformation. He was a player in a drama that was written and narrated by God. This morning, we're going to see Esther's moment. But I want us to zoom out far enough to realize that Esther is not the author of this moment. Esther didn't put herself in this position. Esther didn't work all things around her to this moment. This was was God's moment. 
I want you to think in your mind, have you ever had a moment kind of like this where you put it all out in the line, where you had to choose where you were going to stand, and now you can look back and see that God had been arranging all of these circumstances, setting that moment up. These big moments that we stress and agonize over. When you look back on them, I think what you'll see is it's a big confluence of events, a big circumstances all coming together to get you right where you're supposed to be for this big moment. And today I'm going to show you the freedom and empowerment found that in your moment, instead of looking at it, you're able to look past it and see God in the middle of that moment. So the big idea is this. This is number one there in your outline. I didn't know how to structure it, but it's number one. And then I'll tell you about three chapters of a story and then we'll apply it. Okay. So number one is this. Your moment is really God's moment, but you can get in on it. Your moment is really God's moment, but you can get in on it. Let's jump into the story. Today we're going to cover chapters 5 through 7, which is going to be a lot, so stick with me the best you can. If not, just listen as I read uh, if it's getting a little too hard to follow along. Okay, let's look at the freedom and power of finding God's moment. Verse number 1 of chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. So quick recap, this is your first week with us, okay? We opened up our series in Esther with the idea that God is either going to work in us or around us, but either way, God is going to work, right? God is the author. We talked about how the author of Esther intentionally leaves God's name out of the book. You can search high and low in the book of Esther. You'll never find the name of God. He's never mentioned here. But yet, over and over again, he's weaving God's sovereignty. He's weaving God's, God's control into the story. If you remember the story of King Xerxes or Hazarus, the king of Persia, he thinks he's a god. He acts like a god. He parties for six months straight and tells others to celebrate his deity. And it's showing us how hilarious this man is that he thinks he actually has control. He thinks he's calling the shots, but actually there's a there's a grand puppet master up in heaven who's, who's moving him to his will. There's two heroes in our story, Esther and Mordecai. Esther is a Hebrew woman living in a Persian kingdom because her, her, her Hebrew cousin Mordecai adopted her and kept her there. Mordecai thinks that this, this Hebrew identity of who they really are should be kept a secret. We, we can't risk ourselves. We've got to conceal who we are. She's young. She's beautiful. So as a result, King Xerxes has this huge beauty contest and selects Esther as his new queen. The Hebrew is now in the the palace. Chapter 3 introduces the villain. We saw that a couple weeks ago named Haman. Haman is this wicked guy who set his sights on killing Mordecai because he refused to bow down to him, because he refused to give him reverence. So Mordecai decides, hey, not, or Haman decides not just Mordecai should die, the entire Jewish race should be annihilated because of this guy's this guy's dishonor of me. He's a glory hog. Refusing to bow down is kind of Mordecai's first courageous step on a way to delivering God's people. We'll see more of that in a moment. But Haman sets this plot in motion, convinces the Hazarus or Xerxes to come along in the plot to annihilate all Jews everywhere. Mordecai hears about it, gets the message to Esther in the palace. And then Esther realizes she's in a moment a moment very similar to that moment Martin Luther would have been in, where this is, this is the time, right? Mordecai helps her to see that all of these things in her life were bringing her to this moment, were bringing her to a place of power and influence when all of her people would seem doomed. And I love how uh, Mordecai refer- or references this to Esther. He says, hey, maybe, maybe, just maybe God has put you here for this moment. Perhaps this is what all of your life has been leading you towards. She's the queen. She's one of the few people on the planet with the ear of the king that might be able to sway him from wiping out her people. But, and it's a big but, there's a problem. No one can just go see the king. You have to be invited in to see the king. Even the queen couldn't just walk into the king's palace. So men, consider it your your man cave when the NFL playoffs are on this afternoon. you can, can't just walk in that room and, and you know, there's important things. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, evidently you couldn't just walk into the king's room. You couldn't just walk into the throne room. You had to be invited. So Esther couldn't just show up. We've seen Xerxes' uh, life history. He's not a big fan of esteeming women. 
Uh, he invited his first queen in to basically parade herself in front of all his buddies. She says no, and he banishes her from the, from her, the, from the palace. Right? He, he's not been a big proponent of you know, women's rights here. So this woman just walking into his palace, it's, it's a risk. So she has a moment. Will I go or will I not go? And she realizes she's never going to get this will go well. The best she's going to get is this might work. This might work. There's a possibility that he'll be kind to us. That's the truth for you and I as well. You and I don't really know what's going to happen. Might is as good as it ever really gets for many of us when it comes to these kind of situations. If we remain submitted to God, we don't try to sit in his seat, maybe, maybe God will use us in this situation. Esther might get to be the deliverer God has put in, the, in, the, in place for this moment. And he says, she says, okay, and we kind of left her in the cliffhanger last week. I'm going to go talk to the king, right? And she uses that famous line. She says, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I, I die. Well, verse one, she's in, okay? She's in the inner court. She might perish right where she stands. Watch what happens, verse two. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in his court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther his golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. The key word there is she obtained favor. It could have gone either way, right? It could have gone well. It could have gone not so well. His response wasn't in Esther's control. But she knew maybe he might look favorably on her as he had in the past. Might, maybe. That's all she's working with. So the king asked Esther, what do you want? What do you want? Esther plays it pretty cool. She says, I want to have a party too, right? Everybody else has been having parties. You had a six-month party. I want to have a party, right? I want to have a dinner in the honor of you, king, and your second-in-command, Haman. I want you guys to come to a special dinner held in your honor. This is, this is the entry-level schmoozing 101, okay? I don't know if you guys are familiar with that course or not, right? She's, she's no trophy wife here. She's thinking. She's, she's plotting. She's a smart woman using her knowledge, using her position to make the best play she can. Right, the best opportunity she can to save God's people. It's a good example for us. That wisdom and intellect and awareness of situations, those, those are employed by God. So don't, don't reject street smarts. Don't, don't, don't listen to anyone who would say, hey, you don't need to think or be wise or, or understand situations. Esther is a good example of that. The glory of God and the, the good of his people comes from her being wise. So, so they come to this dinner. Okay, They come to this dinner that she throws in their honor. And at the dinner, again, the king says, okay, Esther, that was delicious, right? But what do you want? What do you want? And she says, what I want is to invite you to dinner again. Tomorrow night, right? I want to have another dinner. The king is pumped. Remember, this is a guy who partied for 187 days straight, okay? He can do two in a row, right? He can, he can do two dinners in a row. So he's excited, unless he's got no problem with this. When dinner is over, Haman is pumped up, right? We not only got to party once, we get to party twice. Look down at verse number nine of chapter four, five. It says, then Haman went forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. When Haman leaves, his head barely fits out the door. Like, I just had a dinner with the queen and the king. And better yet, we're going to do it again tomorrow night. He's on cloud nine, man, until, until he sees that guy, Right? Sitting outside, the day, sitting outside the gate. I don't know if you've ever had a guy or a, or a lady in your life, maybe at work, that everything's going good until you see them. It's like, oh, man, I was, I was happy. I was feeling good. Mordecai is Haman's guy, okay? Like when he sees him, all of the joy, all of the celebration, all of the happiness is, is gone. And some of you wives are elbowing your husband like, you're that guy. Like, I'm doing good till you get home. No, that's not good. Um, well, Haman's upset. Because he just ruined this moment. He refuses to bow to him again. He stands up to him again. And he knows, Mordecai does, he might, he might die for this. But here he stands. And Haman just can't handle it. Give us number 13 of chapter 5. He says, yet all this availeth me nothing. He tells his wife, all of this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew seeing at the king's gate. This is what pride does, okay? This is what pride does. You could never get enough. It, it blinds you to everything else. You become, become consumed with, with you, your glory, your world, your influence. The whole world is bowing to Haman. 
except for one guy. He is the only guy that's going to be invited to a second feast with the king and the queen. And he says in verse 13, all of that is worth nothing to me. All of it is worth nothing to me as long as I see Mordecai there. It's illogical. Like, you're to let one dude ruin this moment? You're to let one guy's bad attitude ruin your dinner you just had with the king and queen of the most powerful nation on the planet, and you're going back again the next day? You're going to let one dude ruin the moment of you becoming the second most powerful person in this kingdom? It doesn't make any sense. That's what pride does to our hearts. You ever had pride blind you that way? I have, where you're so consumed with yourself, where you block out everything, you're, you're never really happy, you're never satisfied unless everything is going your way, Right? I know my job's going well. I know my family's doing good. I know everybody's healthy, but there's that dude at work, right? Who's always on my case. There's that boss that's always sending me that email at 5.03 p.m. He knows I clock out at five. He's just doing right. We, we have this one guy. We have this one situation that just, if it's not going my way, it, it blinds us to all the good in our life. That's the difference between Haman and Mordecai. Haman is proud. Mordecai has become humble. And pride blinds you to what is happening around you. Humility opens your eyes to what God is doing around you. Pride lifts you up only to let you fall. Humility lowers you so that in Christ you can be, you can be lifted up, you can be exalted. The gospel says that Jesus got down off of his throne. He came down to earth all the way down to die a, a criminal's death on a cross. Why? So that you and I who were humbled and brought low by our sin could be lifted up out of the grave. That, that's the message of the gospel. One guy, uh, a friend of mine, recently got to lead his first person to Christ. Like he got to kind of personally walk someone through the gospel and see that person come to know Christ as their savior. And he was, he was psyched up, man. He said, Andrew, it was like I just saw God literally pull that dude out of the grave. And I thought, uh, in that moment, I was kind of like laughing a little bit. Like, but it's, that's what happened. Legitimately, like, God just pulled this individual right out of the grave before his eyes. And you would have thought, man, Christmas morning has nothing on that moment, right? That's, that's the exaltation of, of humbling ourselves in Christ. Why, why do I say all that? Because of this, okay? Because the greatest thing standing in the way of God using this message or using any other message or using his word, the greatest thing standing in that way is your pride. Because you cannot say, serve God and serve yourself. You cannot save yourself. So back in, Haman, Haman goes home. Haman puts in an order for a 75-foot gallows, okay? He wants this built in front of his house so that he can hang Mordecai in the morning. This makes me feel a little bit better. Goes home and talks to his wife, says, hey, you should kill him. Okay, that makes sense. Let's, let's build a 75-foot gallows overnight. I don't understand the science of that. I don't understand how that happened, but it happened. 75-foot gallows built the same night. I can sleep good knowing that there's gonna be a noose outside my d window for this guy tomorrow. Weird, weird dude, okay? This is going to be a spectacle. So he goes to sleep, or sorry, he gets it built, and then he walks back to the palace to get the king's permission to do that. So build it, but let me go ask the king first. You guys ever done that? Like, um, I'm going to start this process, and then I'll ask permission to do it. So uh, start building the gallows. I need to go ask the king and make sure that it's okay for me to hang Mordecai tomorrow. Look what happens. Chapter 6, verse 10. I know I'm skimming, okay? Chapter 6, verse 10. Actually, let's, let's go to verse 1 first. Chapter 6, verse 1. On that night, the king couldn't sleep. And he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. So the king can't sleep. Even after a feast where his belly is full, he, he can't sleep. He's staying awake, which means when Haman gets back from his decision to build the gallows, the king's going to be ready there waiting to, to talk to him. And um, the king happens to just need some help sleeping that night, so he wants a bedtime story. Get the history book out, the, the book of the Chronicles of the King, right? Get the most boring book you can find, bring it here, maybe it'll help me sleep. And it just so happens to read. How many times have we said it just so happens in this book, right? It just so happens on the night that Mordecai or that Haman wanted to kill Mordecai that the king just so happened to not be able to sleep and it just so happened that the king decided to read this book and it just so happened in that book they opened up to the page where verse two happens. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thin and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on Hazarus. This is the thing that went down at the end of chapter two when I said, hey, remember this for future weeks, right? That Mordecai saved the life of the king and nothing ever happened other than it was recorded in a book. Well, now they're reading the book. And it says, hey, th this guy 
Save the king from two would-be assassins. What does the king say? Verse 3. The king says, What honor and dignity hath been shown to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that minister unto him, There's nothing been done for him. Imagine that. Haman wants to kill Mordecai on gallows that are being built that night. He's coming back to the king to ask permission to hang Mordecai the next morning. And the king is asking, What have we ever done to celebrate Mordecai for the way he has saved my life? So I think this, the drama gets so good. You gotta just listen to this as I read. Okay, we're going to read verses 4 down to 11. And uh, this is, I can't make it any better than it's written. Okay, the king said, who is in the court? Who's, who's waiting for me out there? Now Haman was coming to the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said unto him, behold, Haman is in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said unto him, what shall be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king want to honor more than myself, right? This guy's ego, man. This guy's pride. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighteth to honor, well, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king wears, and the horse that the king rides on, and the crown which is set upon the king's head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered into the hand of the, one of the king's most noble princes that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor and bring him on horseback through the streets of the city and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. You need to get the best clothes, king. Get your clothes and get your horse and get your crown and find this guy, whoever it may be, right? Find this guy, dress him in all these things, put him on a horse, Give somebody in front of them to shout, this is what happens when the king loves you, right? Unbelievable. Verse number 10. The king likes the idea, said to Haman, make haste, take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse, I'm sure with a big smile on his face, right? And came to Mordecai and arrayed him and brought him on horseback through the streets of the city and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. The Bible is awesome, man. Like if you say the Bible's boring, you haven't read it. Like Haman is so upset by trotting his enemy through the streets. Could you imagine that? That one guy that just kind of sends shivers down your spine. Like that one lady that just, for whatever reason, there's that personality conflict. Imagine walking them through the streets of Torrington, right? This is what's done for the one who the king delighteth, right? Uh, how difficult of a day that must have been for Mordecai, for Haman. I'm sure Mordecai is living it up, man. A big smile on his face is going through town. Now comes the climax of the story. It says when he goes home, he's in mourning. Mourning like, like, he, like he, someone had died. So in chapter 7, Haman, fine, fine, okay, fine, but at least I get to go to the second night of the party, right? Second night of the celebration, chapter 7, verse 3. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it may please the king, let my life be given me in my petition and my people, my request. So this moment, this moment Esther's been preparing for is, is finally here. And the king asks again, Esther, you've cooked a delicious meal. Esther, you've done a great job inviting us here. What can I do for you? Anything, he says. You name it, it shall be done to you. And she pounces. She pounces. This is her moment. This, she, this, this might just be her chance. She says, babe, could you please save my life and my people's? <laughs> can, I do, can I do anything for you, princess? Can I do anything for you, queen? Yes, yeah, save my life and my people's life. Verse four, for we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. The word perish is the word, same word we get annihilated from. Like we're, we're, we're set up to be just wiped out. Haman had been plotting to annihilate the Jews and Esther uses her position of influence to try and save God's people. She has no idea if it's gonna work or not, but he just might spare them from annihilation. By the way, when you, when you read the Old Testament, there should be these alarm bells that go off in the heart of a Christian, right? Like Jesus alarm bells. Esther, listen, listen, Esther is standing before the king trying to prevent what would be the annihilation of all of her people. 
Jesus would stand in a palace before a king. Moments before he would hang on a, hang on a cross before a king. And he didn't just ask the innocent people be spared. He didn't just say to Pilate, hey, would you forgive innocent people from being annihilated? No, he would pray to his father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Forgive the ones who are killing me. Forgive those who are torturing me. He died for you and for me, rebels who deserve death. And God said, I'll, I'll take their punishment. Esther is one of the great, courageous heroes of the Bible. And Jesus said her main purpose was to help you and I understand Jesus better. So yes, see, Esther's heroics, but don't lose the, the beauty of Christ in all of this. The story finishes pretty quickly, to be honest with you. We'll, we'll kind of conclude it next week. But the king flips out and says, who wants to kill my queen, right? Who's done this? Esther says, as Haman's putting another chicken leg in his mouth, that guy, right? The wicked Haman. Well, Haman freaks out. The king is, is so angry at this betrayal by his, his number two guy that he steps outside just to cool off for a second. Like, I, I got to go for a walk. Like, I, I got to go step outside. I got to cool down. I'm upset. He comes back in the room to find Haman basically falling on the couch where Esther was sitting, more than likely begging for forgiveness, more than likely groveling. But the king doesn't like the picture he saw when he walked back in the room. The king loses it. Basically, don't touch my woman, right? Like, get back away, like, get away, get, go, go, you know, get, get out of here. So he has Haman taken away, trying to figure out what one of his punishments should be. Like, what should we do to this Haman? And one of his little interns next to him says, well, you know, Haman had built some really beautiful gallows last night, you know? Really wonderful construction this guy put together. And in a beautiful stroke of irony, the king hangs Haman on the very gallows Haman prepared for Mordecai. Esther and Mordecai risk their lives for the sake of honoring God, for the sake of carrying out God's purposes. Haman does what? He seeks to honor himself. Esther and Mordecai live. Haman dies. Their moment was really God's moment. And I want to show you why that's good news, that your moment as well is God's moment. And then how to see what God might be doing in it. Okay, so number two. What happens when you begin to see your moments as God moments? What happens when you begin to see your moments as God moments? The first thing that happens is you become empowered to be a part of something so much bigger than yourself. You become empowered to be a part of something so much bigger than yourself. How many of you guys have seen the movie Finding Nemo? You guys ever seen it? If you haven't, come on, guys. Right, that's a film right there. That's a film. Um, Nemo's dad, Marlin, and Dory are trying to swim across the entire Pacific Ocean to find Nemo, but that's going to take a lifetime, right? These two little fish swimming across the entire ocean, there's no way we can get there. And then they learn about the EAC, right? The East Australian Current. And this current, when you're inside of it, will shoot them across the ocean way faster without them really having to do anything at all, right? That's where we meet Crush, dude, right? Awesome. Our lives, very similarly, are marked by swimming really hard and going virtually nowhere. We're trying our best, man. We're swimming as hard as we can, getting absolutely nowhere in the grand scheme of life, in the grand scheme of eternity. We're doing our best, but it's really not making much of a difference, and we get by. Some of us are slightly more successful than others, but the whole time we have these moments where we think, does any of this actually matter? Like, I'm going to work again tomorrow, I'm going to pay the bills again next month, but does any of this actually matter? What am I doing with my life? A few more deals, a few more contracts, a few more dollars, but what am I really doing? I'm trying to achieve something, but I don't really know what it is. I don't know where I'm going, and even if I get really wealthy, even if I get really popular, even if I get really successful, what's going to happen then? The answer is nothing. 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 Just wandering, swimming really hard in an ocean towards a destination that you'll never reach. Say, Angel, I was really happy. Thank you for that. No. But when you decide to start seeing your moments as God's moments, you're going to get caught up in a current, man. You'll find yourself serving people. You'll find yourself being an agent of change in their story. And everything will be so much better than your life when it was focused about building your kingdom. When you focus on the needs of others, you, it's an amazing thing as your life begins to take on real meaning and real purpose 
And as silly as ripping up floorboards in a church, as silly as inviting friends and family to a relationship with Christ, as small and as minuscule as those things feel in that moment, you're a part of something much bigger than yourself. You're a part of the kingdom of God moving forward. You're a part of God building his church for the nations. You're a part of something much bigger than that. You're being used not for career advancement, but for gospel advancement. Think about that. God can use someone else. And if you choose to make him, he will. But he has put everyone in this room in a position to get in on what he is doing. Maybe he's put you like Esther to deliver people from from destruction, bring them to life in Christ. You have this burden in your heart to share Christ with those who are are down and out or looking, looking for hope. Maybe you're in education and you can use your influence to speak the gospel to to fellow educators in the hearts of, of children, to use your influence to, to show how you care for your students and how their hearts can come to Christ. Maybe you're in an office. Maybe you're in, you're in a company with virtually no Christians. Understand that shouldn't always be seen as a negative. That's an opportunity. Be Esther. Be Esther and see your moment as God's moments. Why am I in this office? Why, why am I in this family? Why am I in this opportunity? Maybe it's just maybe God wants to use you in a preserving life. Maybe God wants to use you in the establishment of his kingdom. Be open-handed. Make God's glory your goal. Don't be dumb, right? Be wise, be clever, be humble, but also be bold. Be bold. God's mission will take you on a ride where you'll see lives changed, where you'll see, you'll see eternities change, and your life will be used and filled in a very powerful way, and you're not going to feel like you're just swimming along going nowhere. You're a part of something. You're part of the kingdom of God moving forward. You you become empowered to be a part of something much bigger than you. Also, number two, you become free from the burden of you. You become free from the burden of you. This is what I mean. You as the center of your world is exhausting for you. You are, and I can only say this because I know I am, you are an exhaustingly selfish person. We all are. That's just how we're wired. We, We care about ourselves, right? Bottom line is, you and I always think about ourselves, usually first. But the, the bad news is, what well, good news is, you were never meant to be the center of your universe. I'm looking out for number one. Well, that's great, as long as number one isn't yourself, right? We're allowed to be looking out for the needs of others. When Esther was first confronted about her opportunity, you remember that in chapter three? She says, uh, I, I don't know if I can do that. I'll give up my position. I'll, I'll give up my life. Fear paralyzed her in that moment because he, she's becoming self-protectant. And I see Christians all the time who sit frozen as opportunities pass them by. And sometimes we use the excuse of caution, but I think off, more often it's self-centeredness and expresses itself in a few different ways. I think sometimes we let moments pass us by. I put these in your outline because we're afraid it's the wrong opportunity for us, Right? That if I step out, if, if I try to, to be a part of this moment, if, if I try to be a part of this opportunity, then I'm going to be doing the wrong thing. And the right thing that God really wants me to do is just around the corner. I got to tell you, God's will is not this bait and switch that somehow we thought it was. Like, oh no, he's going to bring something mediocre across my path to see if I'll witness for him there when a really good opportunity. No, God brings moments in your life for you to live in that moment. So often we, we, I talk to teenagers, young adults, they're trying to figure out like God's will, like, where do I go to school, what major do I have? Like, and they try to figure out like it's this, this hidden door. Do I want behind this door number one? Oh no, that was you know, garbage man. I don't know, that's what I wanted to be when I was a kid, by the way. Some kids had high aspirations. I really wanted to be the guy that rode in the back of the garbage truck because that would be awesome. I mean, that just made logical sense. But you know, door number one is gonna have this. Door number, I, I gotta make sure that I figure this out the right way. No, you look for opportunities. What has God brought me to? Well, he, he, there's this missions trip thing. I don't know if I should go or not. Man, maybe it's an opportunity to be able to just go. I don't think God's going to be mad at you for taking an extra missions trip that he wanted you to go on the next one. Maybe you go on both. I don't know. Just take the opportunities. See what God have before you and, and go for it. God wants you to do whatever gives him the most glory. This isn't your moment. It's his moment. But you can get in on it. What will, you, what will allow you to get in on what he's doing? Then go for it. Anytime there's an opportunity to be a part of God's kingdom, I, I want to I wanna move forward at that. Secondly, sometimes we do this because we let moments pass us by because we don't feel like we're capable. Like, ah, 
I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, go do this ministry, or I'm not, I'm not gonna tutor kids. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna witness to my coworker. I'm a Christian, but, I, but I, I, I just don't have that ability, right? I'll mess it up. The good news is, it's not about you. The whole Bible is God using clumsy, imperfect, broken people to bring forth His glory. In fact, if I'm honest as a pastor, the people that I get most worried about in ministry are the ones who feel like they're completely competent. Are the ones who feel like, man, I, I, I've got everything that I need. I'm completely able to do all of this by myself, right? Well, then I get nervous, right? Because this is ultimately God who brings forth his glory. It's God's moment. He's got it. You've got to trust him enough to step in on it. And if I perish, I perish, right? If it doesn't go well, it doesn't go well. Uh, there's a book called Free of Me. It's written by a lady named Sharon Miller, which is a really good little book. And in her introduction in this book, she talks about the freedom that comes with the idea of it's not about me and the freedom that offers. She wrote this. She says, the friend who rejected you, the parent who hurt you, the boss who insulted you, the neighbor who was rude to you, it's not about you. Their brokenness, their cold, piercing words, none of that was about you but them. When your house isn't as big as you'd like it to be, or your ministry is successful, your name is as well known, thank goodness that it isn't about you. Your marriage, your calling, your life here on earth, none of it is about you. It's all about God. From the first to the last, and she says that is some of the best news on earth. It's freeing. This is God's moment. This is God's story. It's not my moment, it's his, and that's freeing for me because he invites me into what he's already doing. And before I kind of close and talk about steps to, to take, let me tell you the deepest roots of this freedom. It's that you are free in Christ. Christ has freed you from the burden of building yourself up. I've got to have this degree and that degree. I've got to be this successful. This, I've got to have these certificates. I don't have to build myself up. I don't have to live for myself. The gospel says you can stop trying to justify yourself. You can stop trying to build a kingdom for yourself. You can stop trying to save yourself. That, that all can stop because God wants you. And he says that you can have his love. You can have his permanent, soul-fulfilling, eternity-saving love. And you don't have to earn it. It's not done through swimming really hard. It's not done through working more diligently. You receive it. We repent of making our lives all about us and we give our lives to him. And there's freedom there that you'll never know the bottom of. The freedom found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't have to please you. I want you to like me. I hope you do like me. But if you don't, I'm okay. That's the freedom of a relationship with Christ. I, I want to be successful. I want my work to go well. But if I don't, it's okay. I want my neighbors to like me. I hope they're kind. I hope I'm kind to them. But if I don't, they don't. It's okay. I have this freedom of who I am in Christ, and I'll never exhaust that. There's freedom in that. And then lastly, and I'll be done. I'm out of time. Is this. How do we get in on God's moment? Say, Andrew, I want to do it. How do I do it? Okay. Once you finally get to the point where you're ready to, like Esther, see these moments of your life as, as God moments, how do we do it? I'll put three questions there in your outline. Three questions to ask. Number one is this. What would give God glory in this moment? What would give God glory in this moment? Remember Mordecai's comments, Esther? Who knows? Who knows, he says, if you haven't come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther is worried about her own survival until this moment where she looked up from herself. She looked up from her own self-interest and looked around at what God was doing and she changed the question. The question was, instead of asking what's best for me, it was, what would glorify God? What in this moment would give God glory? And that is the question that's going to keep you fighting for your marriage. This is the question that's going to cause you to go public with your faith, even though your classmates might mock you. When you realize you're in God's moment, and it's not your moment, the spotlight shifts off of our self-preservation, and I can operate in the freedom of what will give God glory in this moment. What will give God glory? If you're like, uh, I don't really know, right? What would give God glory? Well, the good news is God has already given a few things to help you. Number one, what gives God glory is his word. Read it. Read it. Number two, his Holy Spirit. Some people make giant life decisions, huge, big life decisions, and never bother to really consult God. We have his word. We have his Holy Spirit. We have his church. His church asks fellow believers. That's why the importance of a local community is, is so vital. You should ask friends. You should ask other Christians. You should ask 
your pastors. I had someone, uh, when I first became the pastor of New Hope, uh, this, this woman called on the phone and she said, well, God was, God was calling her to leave her husband because she didn't love him anymore. And that was God's call upon her was to do this. And my question was, what does the Bible say? The Bible says no, right? Uh, what does fellow Christians around you, what does your pastor who you're not talking to tell you to do? He said no. Well, then my answer would be no too, right? We have the answers. Sometimes we just don't like them. So what would get God glory? Well, his word will tell me, his Holy Spirit will tell me, his church will tell me. So when I'm in that moment, hey, what, what is a God moment? I mean, I'm, what would give God glory right now? Number two, what is the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? You don't really need to ask this one, but some of you do. Okay, some of you do. And I'm giving you permission to game this thing out so you can see how silly you really are for being so afraid. Okay? Because you are worst case scenario people like me. I like to think this way. If this isn't you, God bless you, you can skip this one. Okay? But Esther says, well, worst case scenario, what? If I die, I die. Right? If I perish, I perish. For Esther, the worst case was was death. Let's start there. Okay, maybe you're wondering, maybe I feel like God's calling me to go as a missionary to a closed country, right, where they don't allow missionaries to come in, and you feel like God's burdening you for that. Maybe, maybe, right? And if he does, the worst case scenario is, you know, you could be in prison for that. You could be, you could be killed for that. Hebrews eleven thirty seven 37 says there were some that were sawn in two, sawn asunder for their faith in Christ. That happens, right? They went for the Lord and they died. And that's okay because it was their moment. It was their moment. They lived a more fulfilling life than so many who spend their lives trying to maximize pleasure, trying to numb their pain, trying to delay death. So I actually said, what's the worst case scenario? That I sacrifice eternity for seven years of pleasure and comfort here? That's a pretty bad case. So if I die and I'm in Christ, when I die, I wake up in the presence of Jesus Christ. So your worst case scenario your worst case scenario of getting in on a moment of God is that I get to be in the presence of Jesus a little sooner than I would have anyways. Most of you may face significantly less scary opportunities. Much less, much not, not quite so bad of cases. For me, like, uh, I kind of game this out. You know, for me, it's that, you know what, if I do this um, and I if follow Christ in this, maybe I end up homeless under a bridge, you know, with my family there and nothing else, right? Maybe that's the worst case scenario. I would choose any day to be homeless under a bridge with God than successful without him. And then you just kind of ask, what's the worst case scenario, right? Worst case, I follow God in this and the church doesn't like it and they fire me, I lose my house, I lose everything, I go home, I find a box and we live there, but I have Jesus, right? Worst case, play it out. Speak your fears because they're sillier than you think they are. Oh no, what's going to happen? Well, worst case, this happens. And that's really not all that bad. Confess them to God. Admit what they are. Realize God's mission isn't about my comfort. It's about God and his holiness. Step in and watch, step in and watch him change the world through you. What's the worst case scenario? And number three, last question is, what step might God be calling me to take? What step might God be calling me to take? It's okay to be a little bit uncertain about these moments. It's okay. Esther didn't know what was going to happen. When missionaries go to the field, they don't know thousands are going to be saved. They don't know that church is going to be planted. They don't know that something might happen. Something good might occur, right? It just might be. When Sarah and I moved from North Carolina to Connecticut, we had no, this wasn't even a thought process in our mind that we'd be gathered in a room like this. Like, who knew, right? But maybe, maybe God will do something. He, I feel like he wants me to do this. Maybe God will do something with it. Like, maybe, might, maybe this is a moment for God to do something. Esther looked at her situation she listened to a trusted advisor, and then she jumped. She just went for it. She tried it. She, she took a leap. She jumped in the moment. In the New Testament, when the apostles are, are sending out Paul and Barnabas, they say, it seemed good to us to choose some men to send with you guys. That's like the least confident statement in the Bible. It seemed like a pretty good idea to send a few guys to go along. Yeah, we we kind of used our street smarts, our wisdom, our discretion, and it just seemed like it worked. That's the best read that could really get in the Holy Spirit. It seemed like a good idea. God isn't some decoder ring. Like, I don't know if you guys ever had one of those. I always think of the, uh, what's the Christmas movie? Oh, Christmas Story, right? The I'll Shoot Your Eye Out Kid or whatever, like the, 
the pink bunny story, where he gets the decoder ring in the, in the Christmas and the cereal box. God isn't after some decoder ring where you try to figure out exactly what the, the kind of understanding of what his mission is or what he's doing. He wants you to spend time with him. John 15 says, abide with him, bear fruit from him, and take a step into his mission. He'll use you. We overcomplicate it so much, guys. We make it so difficult, make it so challenging. Jump in. It won't be easy. Some of you, you need to give your lives to Christ today. And it's step one, where you've been kind of tiptoeing around trying to feel it out, and your moment, God's moment is, you know what? I believe in Jesus. I'm gonna place my trust in Jesus. I'm gonna surrender my life to Jesus. He's gonna be my Lord. He's gonna be my Savior. And that's your moment, your step you need to take. And that won't be easy. In fact, after you do that, the Bible promises you suffering. But we know it will be worth it. You can finally be free of, of you, of building your kingdom, building your success, and God will use you far beyond what you've imagined. And Christian, stop being frozen on the sidelines. View your moments, not as your moments for yourself, but as God's moments that we get to get in on. And don't be so paralyzed with all of our analysis. Don't be so paralyzed with all of our fears. Jump into the EAC of building God's kingdom, and I promise you're going to be a part of something much bigger than yourself, and God will use you in a way that you never thought he could. Let's have a repair together. Lord, let's have a...